Thank you for downloading this podcast from the British Theatre Guide. For more information about British Theatre Guide, please visit britishtheatreguide.info. Highly acclaimed playwright Timberlake Wurtenbaker was commissioned by the Octagon Theatre in Bolton to write a new play for an older female cast, the result of which was Winter Hill, named after a local landmark most famous for its TV mast, which has delivered broadcast television to most of the North West for more than half a century. I managed to speak to Tim Blake when she had spent nearly a week in rehearsals for the play in Bolton. To me, Winter Hill means the excuse that the BBC gave out when um, when the television went down back in the seventies. That was that was the main transmitter for the whole of the North West. But uh, obviously, there's a bit more to Winter Hill than that. So, uh, what what is Winter Hill the, the play? Well, um, Winter Hill the place we we can begin with is also. A, um, rather beautiful in the beginning of the West Pennines. You know, you sort of get there and then you can walk for miles and miles and miles. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and I went up there um, sort of by chance, actually, some years ago, and I was very taken with it, because I mean, partly because it's a wonderful place to walk and it's quite mysterious, and then the mast is mysterious, and then there was some kind of murder there, and there are, there are all kind of odd <laughs> histories, you know. So it is... It, for a lot of people, it is also the transmitter, of course, yes. and it still is a very important... Yeah, yeah. Um, it's, it's still very important. I think it still transmits uh, most yes, of the stuff does, from yes. the Northwest. But it's more than that. I mean, it's, um, it's the highest... It's the highest... It's not a peak, but, you know, it's the highest level. Yeah. Uh, and when you're up there, you look down on Bolton, you look down to Manchester. It, it's, a, it's a view. So it's a landscape, let's yes. put it that way. Yeah. So it's a, it's a place of stories, but... Uh, where did your story come from, from that hill? <laughs> <laughs> well, the way all stories come, you know, you sort of see something and you think, oh, I'm quite intrigued by that, and then you sort of get an idea for the play, and then you think, oh, well, actually, that's rather a nice place to set the play, and then that shapes the play. It's very hard to explain what starts first. I yes. mean, I'm not sure that the, the walk was the beginning... Well, the walk sort of was the beginning of the play. I, hadn't really, I didn't really have much of an idea for the play until then. Yeah. But after that, the, the landscape influences the story, and you put the people in the landscape, and then that influences things, and then you get a play yeah. um, in that weird way that... Um, so difficult to explain, you know, yes. how you end up with a play. Yeah. Um, so, what happens to the, the people in this play? Ooh, well, you have to come and see the play. Course, I mean, yes, I don't, I I don't want to give up the whole plot because no. it's kind of it's it's meant to be a little bit of a. Um, uh, it's meant to have a bit of a plot. I mean, it's meant to be a little bit tense, I hope. You yeah. Know, <laughs> sort of keep people interested. Um, but they, um, you know, some people are against. There's going to be some big building, and some people are against it, and. It's, it's about that, really. And it doesn't end well, let's put it that way. Yeah, yeah there's something in the press release about the, uh, the tension between protest and, and terrorism or, or something like that. So. That's right. There's a, so there's a threat, and then the threat goes... Uh, then things escalate, yeah. let's put it that way. I mean, I, I sort of don't... I mean, of course, everybody will know what it's about quickly, but I, I don't like to give it... You don't want to make it too uh, explicit, yeah. No, I don't, because, yeah. um, I mean... The play is not really just about the plot, but that's part of it. And um, yeah, yeah. It, it sounds like the sort of thing that uh, uh, that everybody will say it's got relevance now. But we can see relevance in pretty much anything, really, can't we? Once once it comes out, but there there is a there is a lot of protest and a lot of misunderstanding between sides at the moment. So it, uh, without being too explicit, obviously, that comes into it, does it? There, there is something that's relevant now. There is. I mean, it, it, and of course, I started writing it about two years ago, so yeah. it, it sort of caught up. I mean, it is set in the near future, not the present, but I'm sort of getting scared, yeah. you know, that it'll be, you know, it'll be in the past before it's in the future. But, um, I mean, yes, obviously it's about what um, the, the, the building, you know, the concrete, the, the, the you know, the, what's the verb? Concretization yes. of um, green spaces, so that is something that interested me. And and there is massive building in absolutely every area yes. of the world. I mean, not just in England, but in England, it's particularly massive because it's this is a small island, but everywhere else. And and um, it has to look at what the consequ. It does look at what the consequences are. And there there are arguments on both sides. And I try to put both of the arguments. I mean, there are a lot of reasons for building and a lot of reasons for not building or for keeping 
those valuable spaces we have, which yes. are shrinking rapidly. And um, I mean, this is not a play about climate change, but you cannot write a play in which there isn't climate change somewhere no, in the no. background. I mean, it's certainly not a play about climate change, but we live with that. So it's not a polemical piece. It, it's a balanced argument, is it? Well, I hope it's balanced. I mean, I, I, <laughs> I don't do... Um, you know, I, I, I mean, partly because I'm extremely indecisive myself. You know, I don't, um, I don't preach. You know, I'm not trying yeah. to say this is this is wrong or this is right. It's just trying. I mean, I think a play, what a play can do, is try to look at all the, um, indeed, look at all the arguments. Yeah. And in fact, that's what, you know, that's what plays are really, because because different people say different things, and the writer's voice really doesn't need to be heard. I mean, no. whatever I think privately is something else. I'm not going to write a play. You know, otherwise, I would write a polemic. And yeah. Well, that, that's the difficulty with something that, particularly something that's an issue, uh, a trap that's easily fallen into is for every character to speak like the writer. So how, how, do you get, how do you get into the heads of people who are very different from you, whose opinions are the opposite of yours, perhaps? Well, that's the fun. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, that really is the fun, because it's, it's sort of great fun. And, and, and also, it, it, it is always very interesting to look at the other argument. Yeah. And as I say, because I'm indecisive and easily swayed, and you know, any argument can persuade me yeah. at you know, any time of the day. So that's an it's, advantage in this It's case. an advantage <laughs> if you're a writer, because you can just then take those different characters. And, and people have... Um, I mean, they not only have different beliefs, but they're different people. They come from different places. So as you're shaping a character, um, you can do that. Now, obviously, I haven't... You know, there are a lot of characters I haven't put in there. So there, there is... Um, I mean, it's, it's a group of women, so they are not totally... They're not from all the... It's, it's not about all the spectrums no. of the political, you know, the political sphere, but they don't agree, and they do have different views and yeah. they want different things. Yeah, so it does represent our increasingly polarised society. Well, and I hope, I, I mean, I hope it, well, I don't like the fact that our society is very polarised, but I think we, I think that the problem is, it's not a problem, but actually we don't know now. I mean, we, it's very difficult to know really how to shape the future. I don't think anybody knows that. No. Do you think theatre can help with that, or do you think it mainly preaches to the converted? I, I think also, I, I hope theatre doesn't preach to the converted. I mean, I really hope people are going to come and, and, and you know, di well, disagree with, there is no conclusion to the play, but I mean, I hope people are going to come with all kinds of different opinions themselves. I think what theatre can do is just pose some questions and, you know, look at language and look at what we say a little bit and just... It just asks a few things. I mean, finally, theatre has to be, I hope, an interesting night in the theatre. You yeah. know, it shouldn't be... It's not a lecture, and, yes. and it shouldn't be telling people what to think. But it can... Um, I, I, theatre can open up some things, just query. I think, I think it's a very, very good medium for that. I mean, even silent theatre can query then what we mean by speech. I mean, all theatre yeah. does that in a way. Um, it's not because... You have a lot, a lot of words in a play that it's more, you know, more of a political play than a play that's also silent. You know, I think, um, I think all theatre can can pose a question about something. Yeah, and a lot of your plays have done that. Even going back to, uh, I know, I know it's a play you've spoken about a lot over the years, but Our Country is Good, which I remember seeing many years ago, Max Stafford Glass production at, uh, at the Young Vic. Um, and that's a play that's that's about how the theatre and how the arts um, can make a difference, isn't it? And has has that opinion sort of uh, that idea of what the theatre can do has that come right through your career? Do you think through your writing? I mean, some some and some. I mean, um, you know, our country's good is about how it can educate and and. and I still believe that, and, yeah. and I, I mean, I think what's what I've felt sort of throughout is that. We, you know, we use language, and that is makes us different and makes us very responsible. And we all use language, yeah. and therefore, what does it mean? And how do we use language? And what is language? And that's something that I think has. I mean, I, not every play is about that, but it's it's a, something that I sort of think about a lot. And yeah. what does it mean when you suppress language? And what does it mean when you don't have language? Um, 
And then what does it mean when you have to kind of try to find another language um, because we can't really think things uh, clearly anymore? No. And does, does your own background uh, contribute to that? Because you're, not, you're certainly not from Bolton. Um, <laughs> Do you feel like you can be an outsider looking in? Because I mean, you, you were born in New York, weren't you? You brought up in France, and, and now you're you're writing in England. So do you do you feel like you can look into our society a bit? I think, I, I mean, I hope I can. I, I think either you can write because you're absolutely rooted in a place, or you write because you have this floating identity. And, and yeah. given that I was um, brought up, in fact, in the Basque country, which yes. isn't. Exactly, yes. France, depending <laughs> on who you speak to, uh, and and also with a language that was silenced, you know, which is also why it's been so important. Language has meant so much to me because you could not speak the language of of the place uh, because it wasn't allowed, um, and, and and so I think that if you if you're brought up that way, you have I think you have a kind of floating identity, and 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 I think maybe you know, I have a floating identity anyway, but and therefore um, it doesn't bother me. I mean, I didn't think when I went up to Bolton that I, I didn't set out to write specifically about Bolton, you no. know, the history of Bolton, but I was very intrigued by it. Um, and I didn't feel that I couldn't set something in it because I'm used to setting plays wherever I want. I mean, yes. in the past or the present or the future or in the south or in the north or um, northern Greece or southern France yeah, or yeah. whatever. So, I, yeah, and I think I think that um, I think the writer should be an outsider. Yeah. Uh, I, even if they're very identified with a certain place. I mean, I'm quite identified with the Basque country, but I don't write about no. being, you know, a Basque in Bolton. <laughs> I suppose it's difficult to write for some, about something that just seems normal to you. That's all around you. It, yeah. it helps to be looking in from outside, is it? I think, and, and it's interesting because you you discover. I mean, the, you know, just as when I was looking at this map of. Bolton Winter Hill was on the edge of this vast expanse of emptiness. Yes. It was sort of terribly intriguing. Mm. I think when you begin to research a place or think about it, it's it's a blank, and then you get to know it, and it's an adventure, you know. It's a, and it's a fun adventure. Yeah, you've uh, had a lot of. You said this is set in the in the future, but you've used a lot of historical and mythical references in the past. Um, why, why have you done that? Is that? Does that sort of give it some extra resonance, extra depth for going through the ages, do you think? Well, I have this insane theory that, particularly in theatre, all time is vertical. Yeah. And I can't quite explain that. But so, therefore, if you, if you set something um, in, in ancient Greece, I mean, you're still writing a contemporary play. Yeah. And, in fact, it doesn't really make much difference to me. And... Um, just as when you watch Shakespeare in a contemporary production, you know, and you're in any case a modern audience, so you're already living on different levels of time. I mean, yes. You're living, you know, you're living Shakespeare's time, and you're living the production's time, and then you're living your immediate time, which yes. is there sitting there in an audience with the political stuff happening around you, you know, whatever has happened that particular day. Yeah. So you're always filtering various times and, and theatre because it is a momentary thing I mean it's a, a, a couple of hours yeah. you are sort of at that moment um, so I don't I never feel there's much difference whether something's in the present or the past and obviously I write it from the point of view of the present I mean yeah. I never try to recreate the past yeah, as yeah. such or have the way people speak the way they used yeah, to speak like the, the characters in the Love of the Nightingale sound very like modern teenagers, don't yeah. the girls in particular? Yeah, and they didn't. I mean, the, you know, they're not meant to sound like ancient Greek. No. <laughs> well, we don't really know what they sound like anyway. <laughs> no, we don't know what it sounds like anyway. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, you, you are you do uh, teach as well, you uh, playwriting. So and you, you said earlier uh, you find it difficult to explain the process. So. How do you explain it to students? Well, I think I'm a completely hopeless teacher, but at least, <laughs> but, except that I know the difficulties and the yeah. practicalities, um, and and the I'm I'm very unprescriptive, and I have to say, you know, when I say I'm a hopeless teacher, I think I, I don't think I teach anything, but I but in any case, you know, you can the only thing you can do is to try to help 
people bring up the play, which is probably already there. You yeah. know, I always think of plays though somewhere down underground, and then you have to find them. And sometimes you have to go from one side. Of, you know, it's a long way away, and sometimes you start digging, and you've got it there immediately. Yeah. And so, with with somebody who's beginning to write a play, it's usually just a question of uh, giving them the courage and the and and pointing out either that they're sort of on the play but they haven't quite dug it up or they're a little bit far from the play and they just have to get there. Yeah. Um, more than that, I don't think I do very much. I mean, and, and there are some people, there are some teachers I work, I have a colleague, you know, uh, who's terrific and he is much clearer about the process of plays. So I'm sort of the vague one. <laughs> <laughs> well, you can bring a lot of experience. What, what it's but like I can to bring do. experience yeah. and, and, and just practical things, you yeah. know, which, are, which I think is it's very important when you're teaching about plays. I mean, yes. just, just yeah. even that you, you know, can't make... I mean, you can try to write something that's four hours long, but it's not a good idea. And just some tiny little technical things which you sort of learn and which then, of course, people can break. Yes, yeah. And there are... Uh, little technical things as well, like the process of writing. How some some days it, you don't seem to have written very much, and you can feel guilty about that. And when you've been doing it for a long time, I suppose you know that's part of the process. Some days you don't write anything, and other days it just it just flows. So I suppose that's part of the encouragement, is it? I think it's part of the encouragement. It's also, I mean, I believe that you sit there every day. Uh, whether you do anything or not, and that's the, about the only advice I can give playwrights. So you treat it like an office job. I treat it, so you treat it like an office job, and then if, if it doesn't come, I mean, it is true that very often you can spend days and days and days just sitting there, but if you don't sit, then you're not giving it but, but that much chance to come. But different playwrights work differently, yes. and they really do, and, and different playwrights also start at a different part of the process. That is, I think some playwrights have a lot of it written in their heads before they write it down. Yeah. And some playwrights really have to go through drafts. I'm more of a draft person. Um, to each his or her especially own. Yeah. Yeah. But I think that when you're, you know, because I have a little bit more experience, I can also try to... Um, help with the possible panic and you know that judgment which of course I'm very familiar with yes. you know that we all do to ourselves I can't do it this is terrible you know, <laughs> why am I doing this you know why did I make this decision how you know how do you just ignore that yeah and um, and what what about the idea of being a, a professional playwright for a living I know I saw something that you were, you were interviewed uh, a year or two back where you said how difficult that is now to just do that and you've got to get into TV and, and film and writing. Yeah. Is that uh, still the case? Because you seem to be somebody who's had a very successful career. Yeah, I'm not rich. <laughs> you know? um, I mean, it, it, I'm very grateful that I was, you know, that I've been able to, to continue um, doing it because, as, as I think I've said before, you know, year by year I don't know. You know, I really don't know. And I do love writing for the theatre, but I also do radio, and yeah. I've done a bit of television. And I, and, but I think, I think younger writers really should branch out very quickly uh, and do all of that. Yeah. But you can't, you shouldn't... I would say, if you're going to write plays, you can't do too much television and film because it's a different way of writing, yes. that's all. Yeah. And probably writing plays is the most difficult, I think. Not sure. Yeah. So. I don't, what am I playwriting tutors used to write for soaps and he said if you get if you get writing soaps you get sucked into that and you don't have time to work on your own projects and it's difficult to come out because it's so well paid so that's just it and and in some ways you know maybe it's just better to be used to living a little bit hand to mouth you know and good years and bad years rather than getting used to a certain level of living. I mean, I think that's always the difficulty, you know, not yes. getting used to anything. But obviously, as you get older and you have children and all of that, it's you very have responsibility. Yes. You have responsibilities, yeah. Uh, this particular play, Back to Winter Hill, though, mm. you've got uh, a very impressive and quite a large cast. Oh, they're phenomenal. They're <laughs> wonderful. <laughs> These are people who have, who have grown up watching on television and, and admiring, so... Uh, you've been into some of the rehearsals. Um, how, how's it going? <laughs> the rehearsals are great um, because they're, you have a group of incredibly intelligent, committed, experienced, and some less experienced women. Yeah. Terrific director, you know, who um, 
is going to run the world, as far as I'm concerned. Probably is. I think she really is. Uh, I mean, I hope she just stays in theatre, you know, doesn't just sticks to, but, but yeah. she could run the world if she chose to. Um, and, you know, so far, so good. We're at the beginning, you know, we haven't come to the thorny bits. Where, yes. but, but, it, but it's such a... Um, there's so much commitment, and, and that, I think, has to do with these particular actresses. And it's just been such a pleasure, I must say. It's, it, I mean, I love rehearsals anyway, but this yeah. has been one of these really wonderful rehearsal periods so far. Yes. You know, I'm saying this cautiously because, yeah. you know... There'll always be bad times rehearsals. The, the, yeah. There are always difficult times, yeah. and there are always times when, you know, either because something in the play doesn't work or... You know, I'm there, I'm still reworking a little bits of the play, and I don't know if it works. Yeah. You know, and they have to know what they're doing. And when the time comes, and they, you, you know, you never. But I, I, I mean, usually all this gets solved. You know, but um, it's been it's 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 just nice to be with um, that kind of commitment. Yeah. Uh, and the theatre has been very committed. I mean, being in Bolton has been great because we're. You know, you're not in London where everybody's doing everything yes. else. You know, we're here to do the play. More focus. And the theatre is with us. And yeah. sort of Bolton feels a bit with us. I mean, I don't know if it is or not. You know, it may not be what's, you know, what's they see. But there's a kind of feeling of um, uh, support, which is lovely. Yeah. So it's still very much a two-way process between you and the actors and the director at the moment, is it? I mean, it always is. Yeah. I mean, you, you, a play isn't done until, uh, until it's there yeah. completely. I mean, until it's presented to the audience and even then, you know, because you don't know. You know, you know something, but you don't know, uh, you know, whether there's a moment where it just kind of the energy drops or... Yeah. You can't know that in advance as the playwright. That's why you have rehearsals and a director and course, do all yes. that. Yeah. yeah. Uh, after this, do you have anything else coming up? I've got some other... Commissions, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Nothing you can talk about yet. Um, well, I have a commission from uh, a commission from the RSC, but yeah, you know, I haven't. Re- I mean, I've started it, but I can't say much about it. Okay. And um, and I'm doing some more radio, which I love. I mean, I love doing radio yeah. because it's also sound and language. Yes, and the best pictures come on radio. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you Thank very you. much. <laughs> A couple of weeks after I spoke to playwright Timberlake Wurtenbaker, I managed to also have a chat with three of the cast, Cathy Tyson, Suad Farris and Janet Henfrey. Well, first of all, I spoke to Timberlake a couple of weeks ago and she was a, a bit cagey about telling, cagey. Me, telling me about the plot itself. All right, oh, so, right. quite um, right, yes. We won't uh, go there. <laughs> well, well uh, not... is, what can you tell me about your characters and what they do I can tell without you about the plot, if you like. Go on then. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right, without giving sentence. it all away. No, in one sentence. Yeah. Okay. Oh, right. <laughs> okay, it's about ladies in a book club going up a hill. Right, okay. Uh, I'm impressed. <laughs> <laughs> and something happens. Right, mm. that's the pitch then. That's it. Uh, so, what can you tell me about your characters then? What's very exciting is the age of most of them, six of us. Yes. There's eight women in this cast, and just, well, we're all 50 plus. I'm well, except for in a wheelchair. Ah. <laughs> I'm, I'm very ancient in that, um, you know, I started work before the, before the war, World, right. World War II. Yeah. So. Uh, I have to be even older than I actually am. <laughs> <laughs> well, I believe you started off playing characters who were much older than you many years ago. Oh, didn't you? I did all through drama school. I was very skinny in those days and very, very easy to to make up. Lots of lake and grey. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I think the youngest I ever played was Paulina in the Seagull, which was a sort of middle aged. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, but great. And, and are you still playing characters much uh, older? Well, uh, yes, but actually they're, they're often much younger now, which is rather <laughs> nice. <laughs> uh, so you mentioned it's a, a play with um, eight women, is it? Mm. Which, which, uh, which is great to see, a female playwright, female director, um, and older female characters. So uh, is it difficult to find parts? It's often been mentioned in the media about it's difficult for older women to find parts. Is that still the case? Mm. It is, but yeah. also that I discovered last year there's a book by Tonic Theatre called A Hundred Great Plays for Women. Mm. And so I've got it 
and I've been so I felt much hope when I saw these hundred great plays. Some of them have got but, like, but were they contemporary? Some of them are, yeah, and some right. of them are class, you know, older plays. Mm. Um, so I try, I try to err on the positive about that. And I started a company with two other women called Pitch Lake Productions to get leading roles for black artists yeah. as well. Um, so. It's difficult, but, you know, we try to overcome those difficulties and do things ourselves, um, you know, and I, I, I hope this is going to be a mm. regular occurrence. I mean, what is interesting is when we got into the rehearsal room, I just felt there was a difference. I hadn't been surrounded, you know, usually I'm the oldest person in a cast. Yeah. <laughs> um, so being around people of similar age to me and the experience they have, I just knew I was amongst quality. All that experience, it was... You still valuable. feel like you've got something to learn from each other. Oh, God, yeah. But also there are two <laughs> young women who yeah. yes. are giving yeah, so much to the company as well. Yeah. Um, it's fantastic. So it's difficult, um, but I want, I think things are changing as well. I think part of the thing with the older characters is that they tend to get stereotyped. I'm not going to stereotype the playwrights, you know, in their work. But what happens is that they will put in, and particularly now where our focus is on, you know, supplanting um, barriers, but they tend to put in characters not for the sake of them, but they don't write them, they don't examine them. And I think that's what's interesting about this piece, is that... It's not that the characters are equal. They're not equal, otherwise that would be a really boring play. But they've all got their own kind of intensity. However, they're all very interesting to play. It's not somebody standing in a kitchen making an omelette for three hours. It's very philosophical, I think, Um, the play as well. I did a job (coughs) that was making scrambled egg for a day on... (laughs) And on an episode of something, they literally, and I said to my agent, I'm not doing any more shows in kitchens. <laughs> I'm not doing it. Because I was literally scrambling eggs for the entire day. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Not again. Playing some and and the, the yeah. relationships with each other within the group yeah. are also very interesting. Yeah. And, and it's not all roses and light. You know, <laughs> there, there are... There are there are people with very different opinions about what they should be doing. Yeah. Yes. So, um, and that brings up a lot of... Yeah, you, you... It's a very provocative play. I mean, it is packed with ideas, you know, making points. And it feels very... Well, of course it's very relevant to this area because of Winter Hill. Yes. But... but all the things she brings up. It's set in the future, of course, but not very far in the future. And it it all seems very possible, even likely. Right. (laughs) Scarily possible. And probably particularly in this area, some of them. Mm. I mean, you've got fracking starting and the rest of it here. Yeah, right? yeah. despite, so, mm, despite everyone's very, objections. Mm, mm. Yes. What I'm very excited about, though, is the... Um, in the cast, thank you, is the intelligence amongst the cast and and the, you know the in the room and the talent there, and I want to see that more, both you know in theatre and TV, yeah. to be around that more. First, I was quite fearful when I got came, came into the rehearsal room. I'm used to being around strong women. There's two strong women in the company we created. But I, I'm not used to being around eight <laughs> or ten, including the director yes. and the writer, yeah. Yeah. with these. And I just thought, and am I going to be clever enough? Our um, stage manager. That's I've just oh, the third, eleven. Yeah. Then there's eleven of yeah. us. Thank you. Um, but I, I thought, am I going to be clever enough for this? <laughs> yeah. It raised the bar. I think in the first week, it was like, right, I'm, something's been raised mm. for me here. I've got something to aspire to. But that's the quality of the writing. Which is, it's extraordinary, I and mean, the, the the shades the, of aspects that she gets into the. It's the quality it's, of the writing, but also there's a lot of talent in that room. Yeah, mm. you know, we have brought a history. Everybody's CV is amazing. Yes, of course, I credit Timberlake, but mm. the minds of the people as they contribute to the discussion, I can see, you know. But when I, when I spoke to Timberlake, yeah. she'd spent nearly a week here, mm. and she seemed to uh, 
uh, she seemed to be coming alive by the discussions that were going on in the rehearsal room. So she mm-hmm. said she was still changing things at that time. Yeah. Um, yes. yeah. Based on what... <laughs> what <continues to. laughs> she's still changing things. Um, Not anymore. It's gone to the public. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so obviously she, uh, it was a two-way thing it wasn't just her creating something that mm. was a discussion point for you to, yes, to make exactly. into production it is a very creative process so what, what was the process when she was in the rehearsal room what was she like to work with well it is because it's, it's still going mm. on um, she's a good listener I found her mm. an extremely good listener um, and we're around the table and breaking the play down for the first week uh, into units, t- talking about changes, beats that happen within each scene. Line learning is mm. very crucial in Bolton uh, with Elizabeth. Um, very, you know, le- I've, I don't think I've ever learned lines as fast as this. Sometimes <laughs> yeah. I learn lines before a production. Yeah. Um, I just didn't have the time to in this, but a lot of people did come very line ready. You could tell from the way mm. the reading picking happened. Up. Did we? We didn't even have a read through, did we? Did we have it? No, no. 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 Well, actually, she thinks they're a waste of time. We were told that we weren't doing a read through, but we did. But in sections, yes, yeah, right. It wasn't yeah. a, wasn't a, so it wasn't this nerve wracking thing where everybody's sitting there thinking, "Am I being judged because of the read through?" Mm. The read throughs mm. can be very nerve wracking yeah. and, and rather mm. misleading because. Either you do a cold read, which is completely flat and means it doesn't mean nothing, that you are examining the piece, yeah. or else people start performing, and that's, that puts a lot of pressure on everybody to do something rather quickly than yes. they might yeah. normally do. Yeah. And then we line run before we stand up a scene. Mm. There's a, a big emphasis on line learning after this. And, and it has to be word Perfect. Right, she picks Which, up on every word. Does she? Well, that's where our stage manager comes in. Yes. <laughs> yes. Where I mentioned her. She's a demon. <laughs> a wonderful demon. But they really, yeah. They really appreciate when you do try make those mm. efforts, and they seem to be happy to do it as well. Both her. They're amazingly open to helping us with whatever oh, we yeah. need. Yeah. Which yes, I find absolutely. actually quite a singular experience. That's not to say that any employer of mine ever in the past has not been helpful or, <laughs> you know, welcoming or anything like that. But the availability, the availability of people to us is mm. tremendous mm. at the Octagon. I would say it's actually a general thing. Yeah, it's, mm. it's, it's wonderful. It's a lot of the modus operandi. Yeah, here. Yeah. Um, it's a, there's a real pride in the building, isn't there, and the work? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Mm. So what's and actually? Uh, I think it's part of Bolton. I found yeah. a wonderful <laughs> warmth and helpfulness and. The, yeah, so have I. The, the few is, shops I've had time to go to. The theatre is the centre of a small community. Yes, I suppose a bit like the Everyman where you where you started. It's mm. it's the centre of a of a community, and a lot of people come mm. to it uh, because the, because it's, it's where, where they here, where isn't they it? Turned into Wildfell Hall. Yes, <laughs> the audience is. It, it was yeah. packed, absolutely yeah. packed. But even the nights we didn't go, we'd see yes. these throngs of audiences. That's yes. really good. Yeah, and and. And what is, I found so wonderful about the way the theatre is run is that, well, Elizabeth, the director, cares passionately about the theatre for Bolton. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And she knows so much about Bolton. She knows all the council members in, yes. you know, and, 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 and works very well with them, which can't always be easy. No, no. <laughs> <laughs> yes, she's a good diplomat. And Timberlake said... She's got a director who could run the world if she wanted to, but she yeah. hopes she stays in theatre. So yeah. is that how you found Elizabeth? Yeah. Yes, yeah. Absolutely. absolutely. I mean, people have been saying Elizabeth for Prime Minister. <laughs> yes. I'm serious. I mean, mm. people are, mm. you know... They well, she has spoken it. in Parliament already. Oh, well, there you go. <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> at, at least the National Theatre. <laughs> <laughs> yes. You know, they have been saying that, and although there is a sort of jocularity about that, I mean, mm. you know, there's a, yeah. there is an... Awareness of the possibilities of this moment. Yeah, yeah. politicised. Um, I also think that she, it's so refreshing. She's from Croydon, and t- to kind of revitalise or think of the possibilities of the North mm. is very mm. inspir- inspiring. Yeah. Yeah. Because mm. I've possibly been thinking about moving out of London. I'm a Norther in my heart, yeah. and I've got. Northern blood <laughs> in me, um, so I've, I've always moved between the, two, the north and the south. But this thing of coming to a place and a Thacker began it, didn't mm. he? 
Mm-hmm. And probably Norton was here before. I don't know the history of him, but there's a picture of Bill Norton there. And yeah, then the, the studi- the, it's the Bill the Norton studio. studio right. yeah. But this idea that just because something may seem to be quite run down, uh, not as resourced as the South, isn't isn't an excuse to give up on it. There's potential here yeah. that yeah. it could be mined and... She's given me the inspiration to think of going somewhere and starting afresh where the resources aren't there already and mm. to start to yeah. kind of think about it. And I think that's inspiring. Yes. She yeah, said, yeah. Elizabeth is all about possibility. Yes. And yeah. she belongs in this play as one of these women. She, she's an mm. activist. She's quite in- incredible. Mm. Um, so I was a bit frightened of her at first as well. <laughs> I think but it's then, why we're all here, isn't it, really? Because of, for Elizabeth and Timberlake. Yes. Yes. When I had the interview, was, it was mm. like yeah. no other interview I'd had before <laughs> in my life. Two hours and we could have gone on and on and on talking. <laughs> no, it was an hour, sorry. Um, mm. So she, it, Tim, with the combination of Timberlake uh, and Elizabeth and Bolton mm. and the people in the cast, uh, it's, it's, it's a great learning experience. So how did you all get involved with this play in the first place? How did you get to know about it? Um, well, I was through my agent, actually, who um, who uh, put me forward for the part. And, and I was quite ill at the beginning of the year. And I was quite frightened of committing myself to something that's such an ensemble. Yeah, yeah. Um, but anyway, I, I also met Elizabeth, and I, I had met Timberlake before. Yeah. And when I met Elizabeth, I, I went on to another antibiotic and got better. <laughs> <laughs> um, for me, uh, actually, I think they had come to my agent, is actually what happened, because Elizabeth told me that she knew of me because she'd worked with Max Stafford yeah, Clark yes. and I have worked with Max Stafford Clark and um, worked with Joint Stock as was yeah. Um, yeah. for many years so I come out of that area I suppose in that way so that was what it was and then I just got bowled over by her at the interview <laughs> I, mean, I think this is a, a common experience yes actually and I knew Timberlake um, I'd, I'd worked on what it had been pitched to me as a Timberlake was a baker panto <laughs> many years ago which it wasn't no. <laughs> well it wasn't yeah. panto in the sort of thigh slapping sense let me put it that way <laughs> uh, and Cathy yeah. yeah through my agent and my agent was you know absolutely I mean, she's never talked about a director mm. like she's talked about this one so I was interested but it was the play when the play came through the door and I read mm. it I was laughing <laughs> um, and these mm. dick a, a woman of in her 90s in, in the character this is normal life this is <laughs> what we should be seeing extraordinary women as well you know I was thinking about that this morning actually mm. we were doing some warm up stuff this morning and I was thinking about during the sort of meditation er- time of it and actually um, it's sort of I don't know whether you've seen, they did a documentary recently on the sort of blocking of the protests on the third runway for Heathrow. Mm-hmm. And there is an older woman involved with that. And they, this documentary uh, followed this older woman who ended up you know, being strapped down a pipe into the back of a car across that was blocking the Heathrow um, underpass. And, um, and, and when she started off, she said, no, I'm just all, I just got fed up with it. And I think this is basically mm. what these women are, is that mm. there's a kind of thing about women which they live enough is enough. lives, but there is a line drawn in the sand. Yeah. And I think that's why, you know, the danger of women is a possibility always lurking in the back <laughs> of people's minds. I, I, you know, in that way, I who are they really? What are they really? Do we really work as women to our fullest potential? Mm. Mm. Are any of you um, playing characters that are against your own opinions? Timberlake said she could sort of make the argument fairly balanced in the play because she changes her own mind so often. uh, Yes, absolutely. There is um, some... In fact, the woman who started the group, the character who started the group, does not approve of this particular choice 
and where it is going. Yeah. Because they had certain rules about what kind of book they selected. And uh, this one didn't fit into that groove. <laughs> so, so you, yes, there is a, there is a dialectic about yeah. what we're doing. Are you talking about us as people? Yeah, the, char- the characters, the difference between you and the right. person and the characters. And do I disagree yeah. with, um, you know, some of the things in other characters? Or in, or in yours, in the character you're playing? Um, I, I found something this week, and we're coming up to the end of the play, and I thought, is this about self-interest or public interest with her? I will back a character I'm playing. It doesn't mean to say I have to agree with oh, them. Oh, no. <laughs> but... I, I, I think playing someone who does something that's a bit suspect as well, difficult to suspect, there's some th- areas of, you know, suspicion about her, I think. And I just thought, OK, I want to play the truth of that. Um, am I answering your question? Do I disagree? I empathise with my character and... Um, and all of them, to some extent, I can see why people... Where they're coming from? Um, I don't. There's not not one that I completely oppose. Mm. No, totally. No. That I can see elements of. I empathise, which is a great thing of a writer. I think to be able to, to get you to mm. empathise with every character yes. in the piece, especially in a political discussion, mm. which I get the impression, although people aren't telling me a great deal, <laughs> that, that, <laughs> that is at the heart no. of it. <laughs> Um, I, at first, I was very uncomfortable with the play when I got in the room with the other actors, um, because it, it, it's. A, I think if the play makes you feel uncomfortable, it's doing its job. Yeah. I don't feel as uncomfortable with it at the moment, um, but at first it was like it made me think: Am I protesting enough? <laughs> you know, have I done enough? And then, so it's made me reflect. It's made me ask questions right. about my life. You know, and which are good has been good. Um, and it's made me. I feel as if I'm changing. So if a play, even before it goes on, can can do that to me, I'm not changing greatly as much as I'd want to. But maybe that will help the audience to think about all their own lives. Yeah. So it's so um, it's so in a seed for something. Mm. Which yeah. is an amazing, you know, all that mm. out of a play. Yeah. But it's it's educational it, for me. It, it, I think it's amazing. I, play can possibly offer that to us mm. and the audience so is this a play that you hope in the audience will come out or you think the audience will come out talking. debating talking yes. they're not going to come out in, in stunned silence in no, no absolutely not it'll it, it, it'll really make them and think do you, do you and, think and you know, maybe, the audience maybe is... disagree with each other yeah so they you might, might you might couple without yeah. arguing yeah. <laughs> so uh, do you think this might have spur people into action possibly me, when I've looked at being a counsellor last night, I was looking at what it takes, and I'm really happy to see someone who runs a theatre company who is also a counsellor, mm. because I've thought to myself, how do you become a counsellor as an actor? Yeah. And there is somebody on a website talking about, oh, and this is what I do. So mm. things that I thought were impossible are possibles now. Yeah. You know, because somebody else has done it. Yes, I mean, it reminds me of that wonderful occasion... Mm recently in America, where one woman put on Facebook a message to all women that the women should go and march in objection to the election of yes, yeah. Mr Trump. <laughs> well, the march happened, of course, but that spun off masses of small communities doing their thing in their communities. And, of course, many, many youngsters yeah. who are very disillusioned with the way yeah. politics have run. Winter Hill by Timberlake Wurtenbaker will be at the Octagon Theatre in Bolton from the 11th of May to the 3rd of June 2017. For more information, see octagonbolton.co.uk. You've been listening to a podcast from British Theatre Guide. For more information, please visit britishtheatreguide.info.